Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast Running Back Strategy Edition. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's joining me, as always, the one, the only, Dwayne, the Rock McFarlane. Dwayne, we just talked quarterbacks. Now we're talking running backs. Still remains a great day to be great. It's always a great day to be great with you, Ian. You know, it's it's a great day to be great. If not, like, sheesh, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> to work two Ianisms in right away. Yeah, man. Um, had a blast doing the quarterback one, so folks can always go back and check that out. We're going to do all of the different positions. Now we're going to focus over on running backs. And so for this one, just a couple of you know quick notes like before we get started. Um, I really just focused more on ESPN and Yahoo. When we talked about quarterback, we were talking about the FFPC and things like that. But I've had several of you reach out to me and they're like, you know, I don't really play in those kind of leagues. So it's good context to have to know like where players go in those leagues, which is kind of a good way to think about it. Like I really think about like when I look at the high stakes crowd, it's honestly just another lens that I look through in to be like, okay, am I off on any of these players versus where, you know, the market is and versus where, you know, really the high stakes crowd is taking them. And it's just another thing to ask yourself questions essentially, right? Okay, great. Why is this player going so much higher, you know, than another player over, you know, uh, at ESPN. So for example, like I listed like just seven in a tweet yesterday. Um, Saquon go through Barkley. them, go through them. It's a great list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Saquon Barkley goes pick 16 over at the FFPC right now, 31st on ESPN. So ESPN, Yahoo, more home league type style stuff. Travis Etienne is a huge one. Pick 26 versus 57. I mean, that's that's 30 pick difference, you know, on those two guys. Brees Hall, about a 12 pick difference. Pick 36 over at FFPC, 48 on ESPN. James Cook, pick 95 versus 123. Rashad White, 104 versus 169. Basically going undrafted in ESPN right now. Not basically. Only 2% of leagues is Rashad White even getting drafted. It's a round nine pick on FFPC. Melvin Gordon, pick 104 versus 122. And Isaiah Spiller, pick 119 versus 165. I only looked at the first 10 rounds in FFPC. Like once you get to round 12 and 13, the backs that are going over in FFPC, they're not getting drafted at all <laughs> over in over in leagues for ESPN. So just another thing, you know, that you guys can think about. And if you go look at my articles, like I mention it on these on different players or some other ones that I have listed, and I just try to add it in the notes so you can see that. But for the purposes of when we talk about ADPs today on um, you know the pod, we're going to be talking about the ESPN and the yahoo or sorry espn real-time sports fan tracks and sleeper those are your those are your ppr leagues that typically are more home league style so just a quick note a little bit of a difference versus what we did last uh episode in the quarterbacks when we were referencing some of the other high stakes uh sites getting right into things we're going to start off going into the early rounds specifically one and two and Dwayne, as we talked about a lot as we've done our you know underdog streams throughout the offseason there are a lot of bell cow workhorse studs in the early rounds. And yes, there are some great wide receivers, but we've consistently been fine taking multiple running backs in the top three rounds, particularly once it starts becoming like, okay, do I want this legit top 10 running back or wide receiver 14, 15, when we don't see that big of a difference, you know, between our wide receiver 14 and maybe our wide receiver 21, for example. But anyway, first round backs with, just based on their ADP, not that we're calling them a first round back, but just this, this is where they're going. Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler, Derrick Henry, Najee Harris, Dalvin Cook, and Joe Mixon. In the second round, still, we have guys like DeAndre Swift, Alvin Kamara, Javante Williams, Nick Chubb, Leonard Fournette, unless people freak out about his weight and they'd let him drop even further, which I would love. Aaron Jones and Saquon Barkley. So, Dwayne, ideally here, you want to draft one anchor running back and pair them with an elite wide receiver or tight end. But hey, if you two of these guys are there for you i'm fine taking both of them as well yeah and so one thing to remember like a quick zoom out from a strategy perspective and so we are talking ppr here today um but if you look at you know back to 2011 and you look at the top three fantasy performers period just fantasy points excluding quarterbacks so this is running back wide receiver tight end in ppr format 61 percent of the time it's a running back if you look at top five performers in a season 65 percent of the time it's a running back. So while running back is more fragile, while running back has issues, at the end of the day, the top end outcomes are typically coming from your backs. And specifically in PPR, we are targeting backs that we think can be on the field all the time and they have pass catching duties. We also want them to have the duties inside the five. So we want to score touchdowns. We want to catch passes. If you're on a better offense, 
that means you could co- you could score more touchdowns, right? If you have that if you have that role, and so typically this doesn't happen. Ian, um, we don't have many years where honestly I feel really good about if the draft falls a certain way, I would be willing to go running back, running back, running back. And again, your league format matters. What I'm assuming here is that we're talking about a 12 team league. We're talking about you get to start one quarterback, you get to start two running backs, you're starting three receivers and you're starting one flex, right? So that's essentially the mindset we're in here. So if you're in a league where you start two backs, two receivers, and two flex, it's still pretty similar. Running back can be, can be really valuable. But if you're playing in a league where you only have to start two running backs, you have to start three receivers, and there's no flex, again, supply and demand starts to dictate how some of this stuff's going to fall out and how ADP is going to work for you. But at the end of the day, the high level outcomes are really tied to the running backs. If you go to a half PPR, we're not going to talk half PPR today, but just to kind of give the context, 79% of the time, the top three scorers come from running backs. 67% of the time, they the top five scorers come from running backs. Now, as you go down, um, so say, say in PPR, you look at the top 25 finishes, only 41% are running backs, 53% are receivers. So there is a spot in your draft where things shift over to the receivers. But again, it's all about archetype. And so if when I say I'm willing to take three backs, if it falls where you can have an every down back, particularly it's better if they're young, we know they have the passing down role, and the better the offense, that's also a plus. But remember, if you're receiving back like Christian McCaffrey, you don't have to be on a good offense. If you are that good of a receiving back, it can overcome everything. It's it's the, you know, you've talked about it being the cheat code, right, that can really cure all ills for a running back. It really does in a PPR format. So if I can get some combination of, let's say in the first round, you start with Christian McCaffrey, then you're coming back in the second round and you've got Saquon Barkley, every down back, 26 years old. He, he checks all the boxes. Not a great offense, right? But we know he can. He, he has an upside of catching 100 balls, right? Yep. We also know that he's previously been an explosive playmaker. So we know touchdowns could still be in the mix, even if they're not around the five-yard line all the time. And then you could turn around, and it could be Javonta Williams. It could be Leonard Fournette because he's sliding in ADP right now. Hell, it could be Alvin Kamara if you want to place a chip on him and, and just on him not being suspended. We know he checks all the boxes because he's already done it. So it's not just any three backs, right? I don't want to do that with just any three backs. But if they can check the criteria that we want, then I think it's very much in play in the first three rounds. Early early position. So we'll say, you know, one through three, starting off your draft. You mentioned Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, and Austin Eckler making up your first two tiers. Would you take Eckler ahead of Justin Jefferson and Cooper Cup? To me, I've been looking at the top four spots as Taylor, McCaffrey, Cup, and Jefferson. Eckler, you know, we don't need to have our little Derrick Henry, Austin Eckler uh, debate here again. I think we had that in like a random like. <laughs> I think nope. we've had it a couple of times. So. <laughs> well, no, but it, it was just it wasn't it wasn't even in a yeah, it, Chargers yeah, it was or in Titans the middle episode. of a random. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need to go down that road again. Obviously, you feel the way you do. I feel the way I do. But would you at least put Cup and Jefferson before Eckler? Yeah, I'm typically taking them before Eckler because here's the thing. With Eckler, we know you're probably going to be limited to around 50% of the rushing attempts. Um, But the beauty is you're in a really good offense. And last year, the huge thing for Eckler was he handled over 70% of the carries inside the five. He had never done that. that. That was the biggest change to Austin Eckler's role last year. He suddenly became the guy that got the carries inside the five. And so the touchdowns came. We always knew the receptions could be there. Um, Also, like he had been like a 30%, you know, rush share guy and he got the 50%. So that matters. But in the end, the touchdowns are what did it for Eckler. That's what sent him to the moon last year in fantasy. So there could be a little bit of regression with that though, right? So for me, knowing that Eckler, you know, is going to be a little bit more injury prone. I don't, I, I like him. He definitely fits the criteria, but I am taking Cup and Jefferson typically ahead of Eckler. But if someone wanted to mix him in, mix him in, I think it's okay. And if you look over on um, ESPN right now, you know if you go look at their running back ranks, um, Eckler is third. He's going on average at pick five. Um, so he's going. You know, typically when I take Eckler, I'm sitting at six or seven. Usually, if I'm pit- sitting at pick five, um, you know, I've even mixed in like, and I'll take Eckler there, but I'll mix in Jamar Chase, right? I'll even mix in some of the other players you know, just depending on how I want to set my build up. But yeah, Eckler is absolutely great. Um, he's in play more in the middle position, but if someone wants to take him early, I think he, he still checks the criteria. So, you know, you can do it. 
And remember, everyone, like regression, it's all relative to the stat and the situation we're talking about. Because when I was doing my Chargers preview, I mean, 17 running backs have scored at least 20 touchdowns in a single season since 2000. Yeah, they regressed. They still averaged 14.6 touchdowns the following season. So when I hear things like, you know, Cooper Cup's the biggest regression candidate this year, like, yeah, because he's not. Yeah, Dwayne, hey, I'm going on a limb here. I don't think Cooper Cup is going to have another best NFL wide receiver fantasy season ever. Like, that's the regression we're talking about. So just try to realize that, you know, some of these players like an Austin Eckler, like a Cooper Cup, they have plenty of room to regress and still be just fine where they're going. Dwayne, you mentioned ideally Eckler sliding into the middle position. Now, personally, man, getting getting Jefferson, getting Chase, the second round running backs are where things get really enticing because you could argue guys like Saquon Barkley, like Leonard Fournette, have the same sort of roles that we're kind of drafting McCaffrey and Jonathan Taylor for at the top, but we can get him in the second round. I mean, hell, Aaron Jones versus Austin Eckler straight up. I think we could have a conversation about now why is Eckler being ranked the way he is? Maybe that's more so because of what he did in 2021 compared to 2022. I'm not trying to spare Eckler. If you want to take him in the first round, that's fine. But more so, I just love this group of talent we have in round two. And usually, man, when we do these underdog drafts, at least one of these guys Fingers crossed it's Javante Williams, even falls to round three. Yep, that's absolutely it. So with Aaron Jones, with even you know DeAndre Swift, um, with Saquon Barkley. So Barkley is giving you something similar to McCaffrey, right? And the way his archetype looks. Aaron Jones, you gave it, you nailed it. It's Eckler. Like Aaron Jones could be Eckler this year. Um, we've seen what he does without Devontae Adams. They're going to lean on him more in the passing game. He's not going to be the every down back. You're going to still have A.J. Dillon involved, just like Eckler wasn't the every down back. But got a really good quarterback you get to play with that likes you in the passing game. That's a good thing, you know, for Aaron Jones. So, yeah. And if you're playing in a, in a league that forces you to start three wide receivers and you don't get a flex option, like we talked about, where you can use that extra running back, I really, you know, I like getting a running back and a receiver in, in the first two rounds. If, if you can use a running back at the flex, that opens me up to going RBRB. I'd be fine going Eckler Barkley. I'd be fine going Eckler Jones. Um, but if I don't get that flex spot, I'm most likely going to go with Eckler and then coming back in the middle position, uh, you know, in the second round, I'm going to take CD lamb, like, like CD lamb, you know, we'll talk about receivers, you know, uh, next week, but I'm probably, I want to get a receiver or the other option is just like what you talked about. You start with chase and you come back with Jones, you start with Justin Jefferson for sure. Like if he falls to pick six, you start with Jefferson, you come back with Jones, you come back with Barkley, you come back with one of those players that fit the archetype we want. And then what I love about those starts, Ian, um, is you're, you can pretty much you're it's, you can be flexible, right? You're not boxing yourself in any, in any, in any certain way. Um, if you are playing in a league that doesn't start three receivers, cause really that's what we're speaking to here. Um, then you can change a little bit. If you only get to start two receivers and you start two running backs and you have a flex in that league, I'm much more willing to go RB RB. But at the end of the day, it's about the archetypes. If you have yeah. the backs that fit the criteria we want, I'm fine taking them when they fall that way. Even if that means, means getting to the third round and you, and you want to take a third one, I think that's in play as well. And the later positions, you mentioned Stefan Diggs, Devontae Adams being premium tier 1B choices that, again, you can come back and get a Swift, Kamara, or Barkley and be just fine. But we are both now on the same page. Took me a little bit, but we are team Dalvin Cook over Najee Harris at this point. Where do you kind of put Dalvin Cook relative to Adams and Diggs? And I'd, I'll even throw Travis Kelsey in there because, I mean, this is someone that last year was a consensus 102, and he's just kind of at the bottom of this tier one range, even though I don't think anyone necessarily would be surprised if we see Dalvin boom in a similar manner as he did in 2020. Now, Cook is one of those few backs that gives you the upside for 22 plus points per game. Like he's yeah. already done it. We've seen him do it. So I think he's totally in play here. Um, you know, I, I think any mix of Cook, Kelsey, Diggs, Adams, Swift, if you want to get a, if you, you, if you're not worried about Camara at all, like he can be in play right now in drafts. I'm just basically playing the game where I see how far people will let Camara slide. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'm taking him. Um, but I think Barkley's in play as well. You know, I, I don't mind reaching on Barkley's one player that I just don't care. Like if I, if I reach by like six picks in the second round, I don't care. Like I'll take him. I want to make as many pairings as I can where I get Diggs Barkley, Adams Barkley, Barkley and Lamb, uh, Barkley and Swift. Um, Barkley and Cook, who we just talked about. So I like all of those combos. I think all of those things can work out well for you. Um, typically in late position, um, I'm 
most often I'm going receiver receiver, but again, I'm totally open to going receiver and then the running back. Um, I, because of the way Barkley, I think Bark, here's my thing with cook. It's like, I like Barkley so much. <laughs> and if I'm playing in a three wide receiver, you know, format, it's like, I just go ahead and grab Diggs or Adams and I pass on cook a lot of times. And then I just come back with Barkley. Yeah. Um, but, but it's not saying that's the way that you have to go. You could, you could easily just start with cook and Barkley. Like if you want, um, but here's, here's one thing I'll mention. So if you look at running backs this year, like high level overview of the ADP, we've already talked about the fact that there's enough. You could start with three backs if it falls right. You know what? That's great. But in rounds four and five, you're going to have to get selective. Like, so we'll hit these guys in a minute, but just high level, there's only three backs out of the 10 that I really want that go in that range in rounds four and five. So if you start receiver, receiver, and you come back in the third round, you probably need to take a back with your third or your fourth round pick because you don't want to be sitting at the end of the fifth round hoping that one of those three backs that we really want is still there. So again, you're plotting ahead. You're 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 looking at what your plan could look like based on the players you have the most confidence in, based on the players you probably want to avoid right now at ADP. And I just wanted to mention, and we'll get into it in a second, but in rounds four and five, it gets really tricky at running back. That's why I at least want one in the first three rounds, typically one in the first two rounds. Only fade you have listed really in this entire group is Nick Chubb. And you do mention he is fine in standard formats, but man, goes back to the discussion we had in the handcuff uh, edition of this podcast. Like he is two injuries away with the way the current Browns backfield is aligned from being a featured back. If you want to say Nick Chubb is the single best running back in the NFL, kudos to you. Like you have a very good case for that. The guy is incredible with the football in his hands, but last year, 17.5 17.5 carries and targets per game with Kareem Hunt, 17.6 without. And I took out week 18. I took out week 17 even when uh, um, we were told that Dick Chubb was hurt because he played fewer freaking snaps than Dearness Johnson in a must-win game against the Steelers in week 17. I even took that out, and it just didn't matter because they trust Dearness Johnson more on pass downs than Nick freaking Chubb. I don't get it, Dwayne, but again, compared to the rest of these guys, like, we just need Nick Chubb. To, and it's a similar thing to what we were talking about, like with Joe Burrow um, in the quarterback edition of this. Like, okay, we've seen Chubb, we've seen Burrow arguably be like the most efficient players at their position, but I don't love using, uh, I don't love reaching on these guys, assuming that they need to be one of the most efficient players at the position. Give me a guy that's also pretty efficient, but they have the workload to fail and still finish high up. Like, if Nick Chubb comes back to earth and just, you know, averages 4.4 yards per carry like a regular running back and the offense isn't that great like he's had the expected point totals of a low-end rb2 man yeah the thing with chubb if all of a sudden we knew deshaun jackson was going to play all the games and if cream hunt was gone like how high would you move him right next to probably ahead of mixon like one spot ahead of. i would put him ahead of mixon yeah i would because they would be the similar profile right it's going to pretty much be an early down option but Chubb's just the better player, right? Than right. Mixon. You can argue Mixon's going to be on the better offense, but if we get Deshaun Watson, we know the Browns are at least going to be good. And so, yeah, for me with Chubb right now, there's just it's it's the passing down stuff is the main thing. But the other part is there's just a chance, man. If it's Jacoby Brissett, it could just be nasty. It could just be nasty. You could be in too many trailing scripts. About, but Dwayne, Dwayne, what about Josh Rosen? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Josh Robin, Rosen, Jacoby Brissett, um, same thing. You know, uh, both uh, Jacoby Brissett may actually be better than Josh Rosen, which is oh, of course he is. Of course, Brissett's better than Josh <laughs> Rosen. It's just funny though. The Brown signed Rosen yesterday and I, I forgot who actually tweeted this. So apologies, but good tweet by you. Uh, if you go to Josh Rosen's Twitter again, he is now a quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. His cover photo is him at a Dolphins press conference. His actual avatar is him getting drafted by the Cardinals and his bio says quarterback Atlanta Falcons. So the Josh Rosen experience, everybody. <laughs> All right. That's let's, awesome. Let's look at some of the early middle rounds, rounds three through six. Hey, real We're, quick. I know yeah. people are going to ask. They didn't okay. hear the, the name Derek Henry. Oh. Um, so Henry is listed. So the way I break this down, you guys can check the article out. Like I talk about in the first rounds, I just talk about early, middle and late position. And then the rest of the article will talk about based on what you did in those spots, how you started, what you need to be thinking about, you know, in each, in each section of your draft. But the other thing we talk about centerpieces, we already mentioned. So those are the main guys I'm building my drafts around because they fit a certain archetype. Then there's the fades. We talked about that with Chubb. But the other thing is opportunistic buys. we mentioned this whenever we were talking about the quarterbacks earlier. We talk about, look, if Josh Allen slides 
a round to two rounds past ADP, sure, you're going to do it. Same thing yeah. with Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, we want Kyler Murray and we want Lamar Jackson, but mainly because they're going way after those guys, you know, is, is the biggest part of it. So with Henry, it's a similar thing. Henry, I'm not taking him at his ADP right now on ESPN. He's going pick five, right? And so typically at that spot, I'm still going to go ahead and take the receiver. If Henry falls down the draft board, though, I am willing to take him at the end of the first round. That's where I'm willing to take my exposure to Derrick Henry. Or if for some reason, like I'm sending out a tweet and I miss my pick and it's an auto draft, like what happened to me last night over on uh, DraftKings, I got some Derrick Henry exposure, Ian, you know, at pick eight. But he, but he was like two, spick, two uh, picks past ADP. So I'm not totally fading Henry you know, completely. And the reason why is because he scored 23.4 points per game in a PPR last year. He was the number one running back. Yes, he's old. Yes, um, well, I say old. He's old for a running back. Yes, he's over the 1,500 carries. He has a lot of red flags, so that's why I'm only approaching him from an opportunistic standpoint. Um, what I found, if you're going to draft multiple teams, you're going to be able to get him because there's like every fifth draft, he just kind of slides down the board a little bit. Um, but if you're getting to draft one team, like you're going to have to make that decision for yourself. If I only get to draft one fantasy team and I've got pick six, I'm not going to take Derrick Henry. Um, but I do acknowledge the upside is still immense because of the offense he plays in, um, the fact that they're willing to run the ball in all scripts, all those things. Um, and he didn't show a sign of dropping off really yet, like fantasy points wise. Yes, his underlying indicators are trending downwards, but here's the thing. When you look at them, they're still all way above the NFL average. <laughs> so even Der even a lesser Derrick Henry is still better than most backs. Ian, I'm sure you have a few words on Henry, so I'll, I'll let you I'll let you chastise me. PFF projections, not accounting for injuries, 17 games for everyone. Derrick Henry, 392 touches. The next closest running back is Dalvin Cook at 354. It's, Derrick Henry, if he's going to be healthy, is going to have about an entire game or two more worth of touches than the next closest running back, and that's why he's been able to make up for not having the targets. And to be fair, that was the one thing that helped him last year. We actually were seeing him have, like he would have crushed his previous career highs in all receiving marks had he actually been able to play the full season. And that's my big thing, Dwayne. I don't know that Derrick Henry, who before last year had never missed more than one game due to injury in a season before. Yeah, I think we already saw him falling off a little bit last year in terms of his yards per carry and his ability with the football in his hands. There were a lot of games there that, you know, 20 plus carries and he wasn't actually making all that much out of them. But when we have this much of a volume difference i am happy to buy him at the end of the first round but what you said is fine and i also want to we're not fully fading nick chubb we're fading nick chubb where he's going right now that's what pisses me off when people are saying yeah. i'm out on henry i'm out on christian mccaffrey this year if you have a freaking brain in your head and christian mccaffrey falls past the fifth pick in any draft you are sprinting to the sticker board and throwing that thing up there derrick henry a little bit lower than that but Come on, like a full fade in any of these guys, they are not going to make it into round two of a single redraft league across continental America, Dwayne. <laughs> I guarantee it. Like, come on. It's happening in FFPC font some, you know, so that's, you know, it's, it's your high stakes folks. Um, but I was in a draft earlier this off season. It was like in May and Austin Martin, you guys can check him out on Twitter, but uh, really good dynasty follow, but also just, just good at fantasy football. And he's, he's won some, some big cash. So you guys can go check him out. But he, I was in a draft where I was at the two hole. I think he was at six and he went with Eckler and just the whole room just decided to fade Derrick Henry. He got Derrick Henry in the middle of the second round. And so we all had our tech stream going back and forth, you know, or our DMS on Twitter. And I mean, my immediate response is I was like, now that's how you get your Derrick Henry exposure <laughs> middle of the freaking second round all day long. Oh my God. And uh, I think at the time there were only two people and all the drafts that have happened on FFPC that it, that it started with that build. So to your point, very unique does not happen very often. Yeah. Like, okay. That is a wild story and it consists of him going. Yeah. I just wanted to tell a wild story. Round. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that, that's my point though. Like even the, the biggest story we could come up with of like an actual full Henry fade, he goes in the middle of, of round two. So like, that's, it's just all relative. And you know, when, and I would so, sprint to the board in the mid two for Henry, I would sprint. Yeah, like I would probably just, trip and hurt my old self. All these guys are so good and they're set up for such big workloads. And, you know, unfortunately, Dwayne, like we're, we're going to go and I'm happy to go on any anyone else's podcast or radio show. I appreciate the opportunity. But, you know, we're always going to get the question like Jonathan Taylor or Christian McCaffrey one on one. It's like take whichever one you want. They're, they're fantastic. Like that's not 
we talk so much about the first two rounds of these drafts. I think there's far more value to be to be had here in the early middle rounds and beyond. So, Dwayne, let's transition to that. Again, going to list these running backs based on their ADP, not where Dwayne and I had them going. But this is where the public has them going right now. In the third round, James Conner, Cam Akers, Ezekiel Elliott, and David Montgomery. Fourth round, Brees Hall, Josh Jacobs, Antonio Gibson, Travis Etienne. Fifth round, Elijah Mitchell and J.K. Dobbins. Sixth round, A.J. Dillon, Miles Sanders, Clyde Ebers Hilaire, and Damian Harris. This is where I think a dead zone exists, Dwayne, but it's sprinkled. It's interesting because someone like A.J. Dillon, I've been happy to get exposure to. Travis Etienne, love it. Josh Jacobs, Antonio Gibson, not so much. But let's start off with the third round here. I have gotten probably more James Conner in the third round than any other running back. He's just someone that, again, based on a pure volume workload projection, has, you could argue, a first-round pedigree. I mean, I think earlier in the offseason, Dwayne, we both had James Conner ranked like as a top six, top seven running back. We've backed off that because why draft James Conner in the first round when he can get him in the third round? But, man, him and Cam Akers especially, Akers even falls to round four in a lot of underdog drafts. Like, these two guys, if you just – ripped if you, if you showed everyone a bunch of players and their volume projections and you just took the names away and we didn't show them like any efficiency stats you could argue these guys again have first round workloads attached to them yeah and so remember what we mentioned earlier like in, once you get into the fourth round really the third round like it just gets a little bit iffy for the backs so at these adps um like james connor i love i'm gonna definitely target him in the third round have been but i don't want Ezekiel Elliott or David Montgomery in the third round um, right now. So we talk about how some of these backs go higher over on FFPC in these high stake leagues. They fall Ezekiel Elliott and David Montgomery fall in the fourth and fifth round. And at that point, again, don't hate the player, hate the ADP. Then is then a Zeke pick becomes more of a value, but I don't want, I don't want to take Zeke in the middle of the third round. I just don't want to do it. There's too many other it's again, it's opportunity cost. It's all about, I could take Zeke versus, I could take X, right? And once you get in the fourth and fifth rounds, that equation becomes more palatable. Um, you know, as you start to look at some of the players you'd be taking versus Zeke. But in the third round, man, there's just too many good receivers, um, too many other things that you can do to take Zeke there. So in the third round, I think James Conner is a name I'm definitely willing to draft. Cam Akers, I really don't want in the third round either. Like if I had to, I might do it, but I'd rather have Cam in the fourth, like I, like we talked about with Zeke. But then when you look at the fourth round, to your point, it's kind of sprinkled. Like, I don't want Josh Jacobs. I don't want Antonio Gibson. I, I don't want rotational backs in in the fourth round. Like, the, these are backs that are probably going to be in a three-way rotation, both of them. good. They're talented backs, but I do like Brees Hall and I like Travis Etienne. So, so Brees Hall and Travis Etienne in the fourth round are definitely gold. Honestly, I don't want Elijah Mitchell or J.K. Dobbins in the fifth round. The only person I want in the sixth round, which is A.J. Dillon, Miles Sander, Clyde, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, and Damian Harris, the only one I want is A.J. Dillon. So this is what I was talking about earlier. In these middle rounds, things tighten up. So if you look Quarterback, at the guys, baby. Really, That's when we're yes. going quarterback. So if you look at the, the ADPs we really love, in the third round, James Conner. In the fourth round, Brees Hall and ETN. In the fifth round, there's not one. In the sixth round, it's A.J. Dillon. Yeah. And so we just named, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Great podcasting right there. There's 14 <laughs> backs named here, Ian. At their ADPs, there's really only four that we really like at the ADP. I could squeeze Cam Akers in if I needed to at the end of the third round. So maybe make it five. But outside of that, I just don't like the ADPs. And to your point, once you get in the fifth and sixth round, you can look at the quarterback. Don't do it in the third and fourth. That's too soon, you know, because you can get, you know, uh, you can get Kyler, you can get Lamar, you can get Jalen Hurts, the, the profiles we're looking for in the fifth and sixth round. But again, the reason I'm bringing this up is you probably want at least one back in your first two rounds because if you're going into a, a draft and your strategy is you're going to pound these middle rounds at running backs, one, you're going to be taking profiles you're not, you really shouldn't be taking. Number two, there's no guarantee you're going to get any of these others that you're targeting in. Like yeah. there's just not enough of them. There's only four we really like. So there's a chance you could miss all of them. So you at least need one back, I believe, in the first two rounds. You could call it the first three rounds. Let's say you went receiver, receiver, and came back James Conner in the third. I think you can still count, you know, James Conner. You would have a back, right? Yeah. You, you at least need to come away in the first three rounds with one back. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think you're right. We don't – if if these ADPs – start going the way we want them or we think that they should go Dwayne, maybe we'll have that more defined dead zone that we kind of had last year but 
the reason we don't right now is because of guys like Dave Montgomery and Josh Jacobs, like going ahead of Travis Etienne. And then we have AJ Dillon going behind Elijah Mitchell and JK Dobbins. But I think it's pretty clear the targets we want in this range. And that's, those are the exact guys you said I have also been going after. And I mean, there are paths to these other guys working out, but there's just, there's a lot of uncertainty to be using a top five uh, pick on a lot of these guys like Dave Montgomery and Josh Jacobs in a new offense that we're expecting at least a heightened chance of a committee in Montgomery's case doesn't have the sort of touchdown upside to make up for it. Antonio Gibson, Elijah Mitchell, J.K. Dobbins, Miles Sanders, Claude Rizalaire, Damon Harris. These are all potential three plus back committee systems, man. And in the, uh, you know, as we, before, right before we started recording this on Friday, we had the lovely folks over at NBC Sports Edge, a.k.a. Roto World, send out a tweet saying, report Shani determined to use a running back committee. Now, you can listen to the handcuff episode Dwayne and I recorded earlier this week where we talked about why Tyrion Davis Price is a great value with the potential to have a you know physical early down spot in the committee and potential for much more should something happen to Elijah Mitchell. But just realize, everyone, in July, when there's not training camps yet and people are stretched for news, read the article, read what was said, because no, Shannon did not say this. This was actually NBC Sports' Matt Mercano. And I'm not saying Matt's wrong. Matt wrote an article just saying what he thinks is going to happen. Dwayne, we do that all the time. I don't expect beat writers to only report exactly what the coaches say every time. But what Matt said was that he believes Kyle Shanahan appears determined to deploy more of a backs by committee approach. That's what Shanahan's done for a lot of his career. So I think Matt's just, you know, putting two and two together reading between the lines a little bit, but no, that's not what Kyle Shanahan freaking says. So just something uh, to keep in mind as we continue to go through this summer, but yeah, man. And th so again, sorry, go quick ahead. summary, like on this middle round, like, so the, the centerpieces, they're Connor Hall, Etienne and Dylan. Th those are your centerpieces. Those are the players that I'm really willing to focus on and target, target them heavily, you know, in drafts. Otherwise I'm pretty much avoiding all of the other backs that we talked about. And I'm going to focus on receivers. I'm going to focus on quarterbacks, may even be looking at a, a Darren Waller, a, a George Kittle type yeah. play, you know, in rounds four and five, I just want to pivot to other places and build my roster in a different way. So here's a, here's like a rundown. So if you started with one back in your first two rounds, you can grab one or more of Connor Hall, ETN and Dylan. You can throw acres in there if you want. Um, I, I'm not going to do it all the time though, but you can mix them in. Um, but you can also just punt, you know, if you don't want to, because we're going to talk about the the rounds after this and it's pretty rich for running backs. And that's another reason to pass on a lot of these guys. Um, but if you started with two backs in the first two rounds, so let's say, you know, you started off with Eckler and came back with Barkley Hall and ETN are in play in the fourth round. Cause there's just a disconnect. Like they shouldn't be priced that low. Um, ETN actually is sliding into the fifth right now on ESPN. Ooh. So I would be fine. Again, archetype. What are we looking for? We're looking for explosive backs. They're going to have passing down roles. Um, Hall, you could argue Carter could be a challenge, and that's true. But an every down back from college that, you know, his his raw athletic scores like to the moon. It's a guy you want to be. It's a guy you want to be in on, folks. You want to be in on Brees Hall. So yeah. if you can if you take two backs, the only two backs I would be willing to take um, because then I'm, I'm passing a back in the third round. I'm going to take a receiver most likely mm -hmm. in the third round. I am willing to come back though and take my third back with Haller ETN, but I'm not really messing with any of the others. If in round one or two, a centerpiece back, remember Con Connor Hall, ETN Dylan, if they slip into the third round, I mean, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. If, if one of the centerpiece backs from the, from the first two rounds, sorry, not Connor Hall and ETN. So the exception to taking a third back is if Barkley Jones or William or Javante Williams somehow slide into the third round. And it happens. It, it like happens. it happens. If they make it to you in the third, I would be willing to start RB, RB, RB. I would start with three, but it, it's, it's gotta be one of those. Um, and even then, like you could be looking at the receivers and be like, okay, do I, if it's Barkley, I'm just smashing it. Right. I'm just doing it. If it's Javante, I'm probably, honestly, I'm probably smashing it on any of those <laughs> just because of their upside profiles. But you could look at a T Higgins if he's there and say, you know, I'm going to take T and try to come back in the fourth round and get ETN. I think that's also, that's also a valid plan. So if you get three of those RBs, are you only taking prop one more in the entire draft? One or two more. 
and we'll talk about it like as we continue going. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you started without a back in the first two rounds, I think you've got to target a minimum of one back out of Connor acres hall or ETN. And that's where I think acres does come in play. If, if you've only got, you know, uh, if you've got zero running backs coming into round three and say Connor goes in front of you, then honestly, like I'm probably just going to go ahead and take, you know, hall or ETN. <laughs> but if you want to try to maximize and give yourself a chance at two, like you may go with acres and then come back with ETN, right? You know, or you just don't worry about it. And you just take ETN and then come back with Brees Hall. It's up to you, but I think you need at least one of those. If you started off without a wide receiver in the first two rounds. Looking ahead now to the middle rounds, seven through 11. Again, listen to ADP here, not necessarily where we have them ranked. In the seventh round, Cordero Patterson, Devin Singletary, Kareem Hunt, Tony Pollard. Eighth round, Rashad Penny, Kenneth Walker, Chase Edmonds. Ninth round, Melvin Gordon, Michael Carter, James Cook, and Ramondre Stevenson. Tenth round, Alexander Madison and Ronald Jones. Eleventh round, James Robinson, Isaiah Spiller, Naeem Hines, and Damian Pierce. Dwayne, again, you do a great job in this article just Walking through all the potential scenarios. So if you already have one RB on the roster, you advise taking three backs over these five rounds, two RBs on the roster, add one or two backs over the five rounds. If you already have three or more scoop the value, but you don't actually need to force any of these backs. If you have other needs out of these five rounds though, what backs do you find yourself prioritizing the most? Yeah. The centerpieces are Kareem Hunt, Chase Edmonds, Cook. And then if we... Ronald Jones is in here as well. I know we've got some news over the last couple of days, but it wasn't really news in my opinion. So I know I've had some people ask me about that one, but I, I would still include him here. And it was a Isaiah's. roster projection. Exactly. We that, last that's week, my point. last week, someone was saying Ronald Jones could start again. This is the same thing. I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not dismissing this. Like there are smart beat reporters out there that we can listen to, but we don't like, there's a big difference between a coach saying something and a beat writer theorizing something. So Yes. <laughs> right. So it's Kareem Hunt, Chase Edmonds, James Cook. Um, then you've got Ronald Jones and then you've got Isaiah Spiller. And so they're all a little different. If you look at where Hunt, Edmonds and Cook go, um, you know, and, and you could put Cordero Patterson in this mix. I'm definitely not against Cordero Patterson. I'm taking him. So again, archetypes. What do we want? We want players that are, that are explosive. We want them to be used in the passing game. Um, if we know they're going to have a chance to score touchdowns, that's great. But typically once you get to this area in, in your draft, those guys are gone, right? Guys that play on great offenses, that catch passes, that get every down work, to score touchdowns. Guess what? They went in the first two rounds of your draft. <laughs> they went in the first three rounds, but here you're just trying to check as many boxes as you can. And remember we're talking PPR. So here's what I like about this. Let's say you start with, with one back. You've got one back on your roster. Usually what I will do Ian, is I will prioritize and you can let me know what you think. I'm prioritizing in that seventh and eighth round. I want to go, I want to get one of Kareem Hunt or I want to get Chase Edmonds. And I think you can also look at Cordell Patterson. And here's why we know they're going to be on the field. At a minimum, they can be a, a decent RB2 for you, right? You know that you, maybe they don't blow it away, but you know they can step in, give you RB2 production. But if something happens, like especially for Kareem Hunt and Chase Edmonds, like they could end up having bigger roles than what we think. Hunt, yeah. if Chubb goes down, obviously the ceiling is the moon. If Kareem Hunt gets traded to another team, like you're picking up all this upside. And people forget, last year over the first six games before he got hurt, Kareem Hunt was averaging 17 fantasy points per game in a PPR. He's going I mean, RB31 right now. Like when we get to week one, if he's still on the Browns or if he goes somewhere else, he's going to be a top 24 back. Absolutely. And so... That is your RB2. And then what you want to do is you want to come back over these ninth, you know, 10th and 11th rounds. Now I, I mentioned Jones and Spiller. The only, the only players I'm fading in this range are Devin Singletary, uh, Rashad Penny, Kenneth Walker, and James Robinson. Those guys are all going in this range. I'm fading them again. They can, any of those can turn into opportunistic buys, you know, if they slide in ADP it's, it's I don't hate any of those players. I just don't like their ADP based on their situation. I just think there are better routes to go, but some of the other names that are sitting here, they, they could work in like Melvin Gordon, you know, is, is fine as well. Ramondre Stevenson's in this mix. So I'm not naming all of these, but at the end of the day, like I want to secure an RB two that I know has a role that also gives me some upside. They're involved in the passing game. And so we named who those are. Then after that, what I want to look for is I'm fine with coming back with another one of those if you want, if you want to have three of those, but you got to start looking for the players that if things go right, they could give you the huge upside. And so whenever we talk about, um, you know, James Cook right now going in the ninth round, 
Um, look, the Bills throw the ball all the time. The they they may want to push the boundaries of what the passing game looks like. This is an explosive playmaker. He's probably going to have all the passing down role. He could carve out more than that. Remember, folks, when we talk about Alvin Kamara in his rookie year, he didn't even get 30% of the rushing attempts on his team, and he was a top three back. That's what we could be talking about with James Cook. We're not saying he's Alvin Kamara, but he's in the right offense. Yes, Josh Allen likes to scramble. Yes, we have issues with scrambling quarterbacks wanting to throw the balls, you throw the ball to running backs, but again. Those are checkdowns. He's not going to throw a swing pass, you know, to freaking, you know, Devin Singletary, who has the worst, worst PFF receiving grade when he can run. But if you got a guy like James Cook that can be breaking down linebackers, can be breaking down safeties downfield, it can help insulate him. Remember, Cam Newton didn't throw the ball to, to running backs until he had Christian McCaffrey. And so you got to really think about the full range of outcomes. James Cook could absolutely just boom. And the ADP is beautiful. You get him in the ninth round. He's I like all the guys in the ninth round, to be honest, Ian. Like, I like Melvin Gordon. I like Ramondre Stevenson. Um, Michael Carter, I think, more as a 10th round pick. But James Cook is the one when I look at it that I'm like, he could just walk straight into a role without anything else happening and blow up and be a top six fantasy running back. Yeah, that would be his extreme high outcome. But I think he could easily be a top 24 in the role that he's probably going to have from the get. These other guys need a little more help right, to really hit their upside with things happening on their roster. I think Cook, they could just have an absolute plan for him that they want to deploy. They could just send him to the moon. So I'm looking for the upside. So again, you've already got one back. You come back and you secure another player with some upside, but you know can be your RB2. And then you want to swing away on these upsides. I want to get a James Cook, and then I want to wrap back around and get a Ronald Jones, right, or an Isaiah Spiller. I'm going to try to get four. You know, I'm going to try and get three of these backs, you know, depending on the way that I started. But you got to prioritize them because, like, once this happens, like it dries up and it goes. There's a few more that we'll talk about in the next rounds, but that's really the way I want to approach it. And um, if you've started off wide receiver heavy, you can really do it this year. Like, like you can go with the one running back, hit all your wide receivers, maybe even grab a tight end. You come back with this strategy. And man, here's the beauty of this, Ian. If it breaks right for you, if we've talked about, you could start with three running backs. That could work. But the beauty of this strategy is if all of a sudden Cream Hunt finds himself as a starter and you got him as your RB2 in round nine after pounding receivers and tight ends, and you've got your quarterback, look like out. think what your roster's going to look like. And then what if James Cook goes off too? Like you could just build such a jog or not. Like, cause here's what, here's what doesn't work as well. If you start with the three running backs and then you try to come back and grab the receivers later in these rounds, it's much harder to hit on. It's harder to hit on the receivers in the later rounds. And we talk about this all the time. Talent matters more for receivers. You also got to have a good quarterback. You also have an offensive line that's blocking for the court. There's so many more variables um, for what's going on you know, with the receivers. And it's just harder to hit the ones in the late round. Whereas over here on these backs, like if Austin Eckler goes down, Isaiah Spiller is just going to be good. Like that's just the way it's going to be. Like he's most likely going to hit for you. And so... I like building rosters this way too because the upside you get when these backs hit to go with a roster that you've just already built that is just so beautiful. Right now, Dwayne, I have 10 running backs. I have at least 20% exposure to over at Underdog Fantasy. Deontay Foreman, Jamal Williams, Gus Edwards, James Conner, Cam Akers, Daryl Henderson, Travis Etienne, Cordero Patterson, Leonard Fournette, and Kareem Hunt. Just the, the amount of outs that Hunt has is uh, insane. And again, the area he's going in, man, especially like Underdog, when you just have all these wide receivers being drafted so early, like we're looking at Kareem Hunt versus Traylon Burks versus Tyler Lockett versus Marquez Valdez Scantling. Like, yeah, give me one of the best running backs in the league that again is going to be a top. 24 back in Cleveland or somewhere else. Also would note that the way Cordero's ADP is going, man, I've always, I have had him rank. I've had to move him down just based on the ADP. Like to me, he profiles as a low end RB two in his own right. RB 36 right now. Like we are a little bit away from Dame. Like right now, Damian Pierce is the cheapest potential starting running back. I'm not sure who's going to get the first snap at RB for Houston, but we project Damon Harris to lead that backfield by some amount over the course of the entire season. Like Cordero Patterson's number two going cheaper than Chase Edmonds and just the Seattle guys. It really is wild how low he is after the Falcons. They brought in Damian Williams on a vet men deal. They added Tyler Algier in the fifth round. 
Like, I understand last season came out of the blue for Cordero Patterson, but he's back in the same offense that gave him that role. And again, they did invest in him getting that. So don't be afraid for CPAT or especially Kareem Hunt in that range. Last thing before we get on to some of the later round guys, though, Dwayne, is a good point you bring up. Don't look in this range, in the middle round, 7 through 11 range. Don't handcuff your personal RB1 because if you're doing that and that hits, looks like you just lost one of your top four round picks. And again, first or last, we were trying to have the highest upside possible. If you're taking Zeke, don't take Tony Pollard in round seven. You're implying that your round three or four pick is going to be toast at that point. But Dwayne, if you, t- if you don't have Zeke and then you take Tony Pollard, Great. Now all of a sudden you have potential to get Tony freaking Pollard and you're not costing yourself your top three or four round pick. Yeah, that's absolutely huge. You do, especially in these early rounds, as you get later, I, I typically still don't handcuff, but like if someone falls really past ADP, it's like, I'll be open to it. Like, cause people hate Madison so much right now. Like I've seen him slide 30 picks past ADP and I have Dalvin cook. I'm like, at that point, I'm like, okay, like I'm not having to take him that early. Right. Yeah. It's like, I'm getting him, I'm getting them really far apart, but overall, yes. I think what you want to focus on, especially in these rounds, you want to avoid the backs that would be handcuffs to your starters to max just to maximize your upside. Now, moving on ahead, we have our late rounds, 12th round or later. Going to list some of the guys here 12th and 13th round ADP running backs, Daryl Henderson. Love JD McKissick, Rashad White, Kenneth Gainwell, and Tyler Algier. 14th and 15th round ADP backs, Raheem Mostert, Marlon Mack, Daryl Williams, Jamal Williams. Love. Gus Edwards, Khalil Herbert, and Mark Ingram. 15th rounder later, Kenyon Drake, Tyrion Davis Price. Love. Brian Robinson, Zamir White, Hassan Haskins, the Ernest Johnson, and Chris Evans, who I'll throw a like out there. I don't know if we're quite at the love <laughs> I like stage. Him too. Just yeah, I like him. You know, not quite there at the love. But Dwayne, a lot of solid options here. Again, mentioned before, you know, Daryl Henderson and Jamal Williams are two of the guys that I have managed to get on just over 20% of my best ball squads. Like this is again why I think your whole article series here is rather brilliant. If I, you know, can toot your horn or whatever the hell we want to say, because like again, thank you, Ian. <laughs> guys, like, and we did it in our we talked about in our handcuff article, like Daryl Henderson and Jamal Williams and Tyrion Davis Price. Those three guys specifically, you could argue they should be going like four rounds ahead of where they are right now. Yeah, and those, I mean, the loves you gave out are the, are the they're the centerpieces. You know, so you've got Henderson playing in an elite offense. Like if Cam Akers goes down, like Daryl Henderson is going to be fine. He's going to give you high end RB two. He's going to give you RB one weeks. You know, we saw it. We've already seen it. We saw it last year. Um, if you look at Rashad white, if something happens to Leonard Fournette or if the weight thing just really is an issue, it's not something I know you and I are like overbuilding up at this point, but look, it's not something we like. We don't like the fact that Lenny showed up fat, you know, and Rashad white just has a great receiving profile. Again, Look at these things. There's archetypes. Daryl Henderson plays in a great division that's going to have shootouts on a great offense. And he's the next guy in line. He could have some standalone value. For all we know, it could still end up being a, it could be like a 50 50 split. And like that's in the range of outcomes for Daryl yeah. Henderson. But where you're getting him, it's assuming he's only going to be like a 30% back with contingent upside. And so the price is right on Daryl Henderson. If you look at Tyrion Davis price, it's kind of similar. Another offense that we know is good. We know they want to run the football. We're hearing more and more noise that, you know, it really could be more of a committee. He's a very different player than Elijah Mitchell, right? He's a bigger guy. He can play between the tackles. We've now heard in three different reports that the 49ers are concerned about the size of Elijah Mitchell, that they're concerned about the durability. And so, and, and also in these reports, talking about Tyrion Davis-Price being a very different runner. What if really last year the plan all along was Trey Sermon was supposed to be the guy between the tackles and Elijah Mitchell was going to be more the jet back? I think that probably is what they had in mind. Trey Sermon, you know, look, he 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 face planted you know there's no there's no other way to put it you know he's a guy that just didn't come through and so they've got an idea here they're trying to go after and so with Tyrion Davis Price plays in that kind of offense and then when you look at Jamal Williams he's a little bit different but just a player we know that can it can play every down um it's a guy that's on a, an offense that's we have I think we have Detroit's offensive line correct me if I'm wrong Ian ranked third. number two I think that's a third third, third. either so way. top three they've spent a lot of draft capital on this offensive line it's an offense that could be ascending. We've seen Jared Goff operate a good offense in the past. Um, they've got more weapons around him. There's going to be more, more opportunities for touchdowns. And oh, by the way, we love DeAndre Swift, but he doesn't have a perfect profile. His PFF rushing grade and receiving grade are more like an RB3 over the last two years. They are not an RB1. So there could come a point where the coaches could just be like, you know, 
I know he spent this first rounder on Swift, but like, you know, he's kind of boom bust. He makes a big play or he loses yards. And sometimes coaches don't just don't like that. And so there's a lot of outs for Jamal Williams. We're not saying that's going to happen. We're not saying don't draft uh, Swift. He has the profile you want, right? The explosive playmaker who gets the receiving down work and he could improve. But Jamal Williams definitely has outs. The one other player that I'll mention here, and I know you're lower on him than me, but it is Gainwell. And it's just because, again, archetype, receiving profile, Looks like he could be an explosive playmaker and you're getting him late. You know, he's a guy that you can just drop later. You know what I mean? But it, it right now it's like, he's a guy that I want to have in the mix because he at least fits the archetype. And I don't pretend, I don't, I can't pretend to be good enough to predict every year, which exactly, which guys exactly are going to hit. So we're really looking for these archetypes. Henderson white playing on the great offenses. There's huge upside. If someone goes down, really the same thing for Tyrion Davis price. When you look at Gainwell, it's back to that receiving archetype. White also gives you some of that. And then Jamal Williams, you know, just really a good all round player that we know can play all, all the downs on an offense that could be better than what we think. So he kind of fits in that group, you know, with Henderson. So those are the guys that I love the most. Um, and man, again, Tyrion Davis price, like that's 15th round and beyond. Like yeah. you can get him with the last pick. He's going to start moving up now because there's enough noise. There's enough news around him um, that you'll have to, you know, probably start accounting for it. But again, on ESPN right now, like it's just, and I looked at it again this morning, like he's barely got an up arrow by his name. Now I don't know how they calculate the ADP. So I don't know if that's like taking the last three months of ADP and that gets 95% of the weight. And then the last week gets 5%. So that could determine like, how those calculations are working. Um, and that could be, maybe he's moving more than what we think um, because I can't, the way their data is set up, I can't like go in and look like at all the drafts and say like, oh, here's where he's actually going. But he's still only being drafted 2% of the time. So it's a guy that you can take with the last pick of your draft. Gamewell is someone that I'm going to go back, watch all of his targets, make sure I'm remembering everything about him just right. I did this with Juju yesterday, Dwayne. I wanted to just send out every single reception he had from last year because I was that convinced that there wasn't a single good one. I will say, <laughs> first two weeks of last year before Juju got hurt, he had a couple nice yak plays, had a nice contested catch down the sideline. What about the playoff the game Bills. at the end when he kind of came on? Meh. But anyway, with, okay. yeah, with, uh, I mean, he, he was coming back early from an injury. I'm not going to, uh, but he only really had two games before he had the rib thing pop up in, uh, in week three, even before he had the, uh, I think labrum tear that actually took him out for the majority of the season. So and he's been dealing with injuries for three years. So that's the other caveat I throw out there for him as hard as I've been on him. Yeah. You know, remember the year after Antonio Brown left right there in that first game and they didn't talk about it a lot, but he hurt his foot or it was his toe. Um, it was a Monday night game. I remember it. Um, and it might, might've been the second week of the season that year, whenever Juju was basically like a second round pick because Antonio Brown yeah. left the team. He was supposed and to lead the NFL in targets. Got hurt right away. So, I mean, that's oh. definitely, anyway, I know this is not a Juju pod, so go ahead. I had a, uh, draft that year, Dwayne, where at the turn I went Juju and you know, the Browns new wide receiver one OBJ. That was a real, real productive. Uh, I, 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 I definitely had that turn in a draft or two as well. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, oh. yeah here's the here's the beauty of those team the, of those teams i usually draft you know is somewhere between 12 and 30 teams you know that are not best ball mm. uh, the beauty of those teams was by week four i just didn't need to pay attention to them <laughs> <laughs> i saw some tweet and the person was like uh like I, what, winning your draft is more important than winning your championship because the draft, like everyone's still invested in it. Everyone's excited about fantasy football. When you win the championship, no one cares anymore. They've already moved on to yeah, other things. Like, it's, like, it's happening during the, the holidays. Have tuned out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Well, Dwayne, do you have any other final thoughts about what we just talked about? Again, everyone can find this on pff.com fantasy football draft strategy, the optimal approach for picking running backs in 2022. No, the only other thing I'll say is like um, reading this in conjunction with the quarterback article, the wide receiver article hit on PFF today. So you'll see these things really all weave together because, again, it was a, to start, you know, it was a zoom out looking across all the positions. Where do we think the pockets of value are? And then if we like start putting that all back together, like, can we build an if then kind of strategy? If I'm drafting and I have X players and this many players are gone, like, what What do I do? And so you'll kind of see the whole thing start to come together. I won't read every all of the summary here at the end. i got to leave something for you guys to go click on the link for, I guess. Um, but the optimal strategy based on start, you know, I lay out just like what you talked about earlier. Like, if you've got one running back on your roster by round seven, but the other caveat I'll throw in, like, on these later, 
but you have a total of three because that's different, right? If you have one running back on your roster by round seven and you have a total of four, that kind of thing. And so it just, again, lays out probably what you should be thinking about, how many of these players you want to be targeting in these late rounds based on what you've done with your roster so far. Great stuff, Mr. McFarlane. You can, again, check out on pff.com. My guide to all the handcuffs around the league. We also recorded a pod about that last week, and we will be back with wide receiver and tight end breakdowns. And don't forget, got a great guest coming up soon, Mr. Ray G. Going to be breaking down all the rookies specifically, Hope hopefully getting his insight on potential late-round values. I'm sure we'll t- be talking plenty more about Tyrion Davis Price in that one. For Dwayne, I'm Ian. Thanks so much for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody.